I finish, you can be turning to Acts chapter 19. But just to kind of get us up and running at full speed, uh, this is written by Luke, the physician who joined the missionary team with Paul and Silas, and, and he's now out on the field, and he's recording everything that's going on. You might know Luke from the gospel that he wrote, the gospel of Luke, uh, one of four gospels that tell us who Jesus is and all that Jesus did. And then in Acts chapter 1, Luke opens up to Theophilus, lover of God. He says, uh, these are the things I showed you that Jesus began to do and teach. And then going right into verse 4 of chapter 1, we get the words of Jesus that you should wait you should tarry for the promise of the Father, which we see in Acts 1.8 will be the, the Holy Spirit, the power to be witnesses for Jesus Christ in Ju Jerusalem, uh, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And sure enough, chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell and people were declaring the wonders of God and people from all around the planet were getting saved and we just started working our way through the book of Acts, the actions of the Holy Spirit. If the Gospel of Luke and the Gospels are the actions of Jesus Christ, the book of Acts, beginning uh, with uh, Jesus' promise in the day of Pentecost, is the action, the activity of the Holy Spirit in His church. Uh, and, and that's the days that we live in today. And that last week we discussed, as Paul went on his second missionary journey, he found himself in Ephesus, and he found some believers there who had heard about Jesus. They had believed in Jesus. They had received Jesus. But Paul asked, have any of you, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, we haven't heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And so they, they got the full information, uh, right, the 401, they got the download, and Paul laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. We pick up last week at verse 19. I'll just read quickly. We read in the book of Ephesus, right, because he's in Ephesus. We re read in the book of Ephesians, which Paul is going to write to the Ephesians during his third missionary journey. We read in uh, chapter 4, beginning at verses 7 and 8, speaking of Jesus Christ, uh, one God, one Father, one Spirit, one Lord of all, above all, in all, and through you all. And he says, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Speaking of that anointing, speaking of that Holy Spirit that every one of us receives, therefore he says, when he, Jesus Christ, ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. That's quoting out of Psalm 66, 18. So we read in verse 11 in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, and he, Jesus himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, okay? And so this gift of teaching, this gift of preaching, the gift of being an evangelist, going out and sharing the gospel, this gift of being a missionary and going out and planting churches, and all these things are gifts of the Holy Spirit. You would say maybe those are some of the common gifts, some of the normal gifts, some of the regular gifts that you would see uh, in the church. Every church would have these gifts operating. You would, we, you'd be able to say, last week we had Michael Farrar from Calvary Chapel uh, Bible College in Dumaguete, Philippines, where I used to teach. And uh, it's funny here, I would say this teaching at the School of Tyrannus for two years probably qualifies as the first recorded New Testament Bible College where people would come and they'd be trained and they would grow up and they would be sent out to plant more churches. We know that uh, Thessalonica was nearby here, Hierapolis, Colossae. Many of these places were in the region and even in Asia, we're going to find out that the word spread everywhere. And so they kind of had this teaching ministry going on. Um, Kind of an interesting thing, Calvary Chapel Bible Institute. We have a number of people in the room today that have been to Calvary Bible Institute out of the church that we come from, Joshua Springs Calvary Chapel down in uh, Southern California. But a lot of people in this room right now have gone through that and uh, gone through that program. That's something else I've been teaching with this uh, Calvary Bible Institute. 
And by God's grace, we'll see as, as things pan out, this uh, fall, this October, I'll be traveling to Sudan to work with uh, Calvary Bible Institute and also far-reaching ministries to train up the chaplains that are going out there into the battlefield and uh, equipping them to stand alongside those soldiers who are giving their lives for their families, for their villages, and those kinds of things. And so this is that work ongoing, and we read about that, uh, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Verse 10, and this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And so the word is going forward, that word that is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Faith comes by hearing that word, and people are being born again. Now we pick up at verse 11, uh, where we dropped off last week. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and diseases left them and the evil spirits went out from them, okay? Now, this is something we don't see commonly in the church, right? You're going to see preaching. You're going to see teaching. You're going to see evangelism. You're going to see these things regularly in a church, but these are... uh, unusual or uh, a better translation is miracles not of the ordinary kind. Now, I just want to take a moment to just talk about that. That implies that miracles are ordinary. God is a miracle maker, always was, always will be, yesterday, today, and forever. And God is constantly doing miracles, many of the miracles, just that miracle of faith and coming to a relationship with Jesus Christ. We witness that here weekly. Every time we gather together with the Lord, we grow, we're discipled, um, and we're empowered to go out. But these are miracles not of an ordinary kind or unusual miracles, and in this case, Paul who was that tent maker, they were taking his sweat rags and his apron. So when he was working, building tents, he'd put his apron on, he'd tie some kind of rag around his head, he'd work and and sweat, and then somebody would go and snatch that rag and go run over and lay it on somebody, and people were getting healed. Now, this is not your normal kind of miracle, if you want to call it that, these are unusual. And we see, uh, we studied last time we were together uh, in 1 Corinthians that there are all kinds of gifts of healing, of miracles, of uh, speaking in tongues. Do all speak in tongues? No. The Bible says that. Do all heal? No. Do all do miracles? No, okay, but these things are evidence that God is in the house. These are the acts of the Holy Spirit. That's what Luke is helping us to see and record in all of this. I like this. In Mark chapter 14, just to name a couple places where we see these happening, in Mark chapter 13, uh, let's pick up, well, Luke 8, 44. We know this very well where the woman with the issue of blood pressed through the crowd because she wanted to touch the hem of Jesus' garment, and she was able to get through. In Acts chapter 5, we've already read, where people, even when Peter would pass by and a shadow would fall on them, they would get healed, right? We'd see uh, uh, crazy kinds of things. In Luke chapter 4, this is Jesus in his hometown of Nazareth preaching to the people. And in verse 18, Jesus gets up to speak and he says, the Spirit... This is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's overflowing me. I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Ordinary miracle. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Compassion. Maybe ordinary miracle. To proclaim liberty to the captives. You're free in Christ. (laughs) Your sins are forgiven. The recovery of sight to the blind, a lot less ordinary. To set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so we see all these different things. Uh, In Luke's gospel, again, who's writing this, uh, in chapter 9, Jesus sends out the 12 apostles to go ahead and declare the good news, and it says to heal the sick, to cleanse lepers, to raise the dead, 
and to cast out demons. And we see that repeated. Luke writes about it in chapter 10, Luke 10, where he sends now 70 out to do the same thing. And so we see this is something that would be expected in the church. Jesus said, wait for the promise. It's going to come. And sure enough, on the day of Pentecost, it came. And the Holy Spirit is now active in His church as we come together for many, many things. Some of these are less common miracles. I often I, I think about this. I've pondered this a lot. I'm sure you probably have also. I think one of the reasons we don't see more amazing miracles is because we have little faith. Jesus was constantly chiding his disciples, oh, ye of little faith, you know? I asked you to do this little thing, and you're like, I don't know, I can't do it. And he goes, man, if you have the faith, you can speak to that mountain and say, be cast into the sea, right? And that would be a pretty unusual miracle. And yet we do see, and I have experienced miracles that are just off the chart, that it's, it's earth shattering. Everybody that witnesses it is like, whoa, Jesus is in the house. That was God right there, right? And we'll definitely see those kinds of things. But one of the things I think about as much as we see faith and we see the Holy Spirit manifest and miracles at work in the church and all that God did through Jesus and through the church, through the 12, through the 70. Do you remember what Jesus said uh, after he had witnessed to the woman of the well in, G in John chapter 4? And then all the Samaritans from that village came out and he stayed for a while and a lot of them were born again and a church is planted in this, this Samaritan village. But then he looks out and he says, the field. You guys notice the field? The field. It's white unto harvest, saying that there are souls out there ready to be gathered. Be those fishers of men. Be that salt and light. Get out there in the world and preach that good word because there are souls to be saved. The field is white unto harvest. Pray, therefore, for workers to go into that field, and we are part of that crew to this day operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we see these miracles taking place, uh, and even unusual ones, even a handkerchief or an apron that would uh, cause disease to leave the body, or evil spirits to go out, to cast out demons. We read about that, the 12 and the 70, raise dead, cast out spirits, and all those kinds of things that were going on. And so this is happening in the book of Acts, and it's, it's pretty cool, you know, I think it's neat. Um, so he goes on then in verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. Okay, and so you get these itinerant Jewish preachers, right? They, they've been raised up in the synagogue. They're rabbis. They're trained. They know what the Scripture says. But now they want to go out and cast out demons, exorcism right? To cast out these demons. And it can be really kind of crazy. These seven sons of Sceva, you can almost liken them kind of like to a traveling healing road show. Have you ever seen those things in person or maybe at least on TV? These guys that pull into town with their wagon and they set up business and come and be healed, you know, and we're going to have healings tonight and all these kind of crazy things. They're full of superstition and ceremonies and rituals and they're, they're really meant to target the gullible, and they're meant to raise money, okay? This is a profit-making venture that these guys are into. And so, these seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, uh, sons of a Jewish priest who did so. So, they, they should know better, okay? They're learned guys. They should know better. In verse 15, I love this. It says, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Ooh, kind of got slapped down right there, but it's going it's to be a big time slap down, okay? This is not just a little one, um, but in this, uh, they, it says they cast them, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches, 
Okay, so Paul's in town. He's at the school of Tyrannus. He's there for two years. We don't know at what point in this two years this happens, but nevertheless, it's like you guys are all going after Paul. You're listening to all that stuff. Remember how so many of the Jews received and believed, but so many of them became bitter. And some of these guys thought, man, there's some money in this, right? And we see that, this, this television evangelist type things. I'm not saying everybody that goes on television is bad, but when you know this ministry costs millions and millions of dollars just to put it on the air and you wonder, what are my dollars going for? It's something just to pray through seriously. There's a lot of um, crooks out there. We've got to be careful. Well, these guys clearly are some of those. We cast out demons or we cast you out according to Jesus whom Paul preaches. You see, they didn't know Jesus. They just knew that Paul was getting some traction, and they wanted some of the action, okay? That's all that's going on here. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And there's two words here where it says, Jesus I know, the word know. We talked about this before, ginosko. Uh, is a s- experiential knowledge, right? We talked last week, Lincoln said she had actually met Governor Brad Little. That's an experience, you know, shook his hand. I know him, whereas many of us know of him. Well, this evil spirit says, Jesus, I know. I have experiential knowledge. Um, Jude, or I mean, sorry, James would say, you believe in one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble, okay? So that's not rocket science to say, yeah, I know Jesus, all created things. We read in the book of Philippians at Jesus' name will bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. Even the, the demons, as they're cast into hell, they'll be saying, you're right, I'm wrong. There is only one God, and this is what they say. The evil spirit said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. It's a different Greek word for know, epistemi, which is to say I know of. We've heard about Paul. You know, he's, he's making waves. He's out there. But you, who are you, okay? As we go forward in this business of, of sharing Christ and casting out demons, we need to be careful who we're dealing with and how we're going about this business, Let me talk to you just a couple seconds about the business of casting out demons. Jude, Jesus' brother, writes in the book of Jude, I'll pick up at verse 8, he says, speaking of these false prophets, these exorcists, this whole lot of people who are fakes, they're charlatans, um, they're just profiting off of the name of Christ. Verse 8 of Jude, likewise, also these dreamers or fantasizers, defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And so, puts up this this situation where even Michael, the archangel, most powerful angel in heaven, most, did you hear me? Most powerful angel in heaven when disputing with Satan, another angel, a fallen angel, not as powerful as Michael, but even Michael, when disputing with an angel, didn't rebuke Satan directly, but says, the Lord rebuke you. This is one of the things I would strongly caution you when you're dealing with demonic situations, and there are absolutely demons, and there is demon possession, but we have to recognize that when we're dealing with Satan, we do not go toe to toe. He will eat your lunch, okay? When we were in Rainbow Village in the Philippines, uh, on the compound, we had a large dog by the name of Gordo. Gordo was a saint, or not, a German shepherd and a big dog, and big dogs are very intimidating in the Philippines, so just his presence would keep people from jumping the wall and coming in and ripping us off and things like that. But Gordo was dumber than dirt, and you couldn't train him, and he was a puppy till the day he died, basically, and his, his gig would be anytime he saw somebody, he would come bounding up, 
<laughs> and jump up on you, right? And in the Philippines, everything's muddy and wet most of the year, and you're just covered head to toe, and this dog is up, a stinky dog, <laughs> and he'd freak people out. Well, the toddlers at Rainbow Village, we would usually have 15 to 20 toddlers at any given time, and they would go out onto the playground, and then we had a little bamboo pole fence, but it wouldn't stop Gordo, and the Toddlers would go out, and they'd always be afraid of Gordo, because Gordo would come up and knock them down, bowl them over. The first thing many kids at Rainbow Village learned to say was not mama, dada, or something like that. It was, ayow, Gordo. Now, that's weird. That means don't or stop. Gordo, no, no, Gordo, no. That was the first thing these little kids learned, right? Because they were scared to death this dog was going to come and take them out. And so I'd be walking the compound quite often, and uh, Gordo would be out running around. The kids would come out, and they would look up, and they'd see Gordo coming, and they would yell, Ayow, Gordo! Ayow, Gordo! And then they would get on the other side of me. They would put me between them and Gordo, and I would take the full force of Gordo, right? That picture is what Michael, the archangel, did when confronting Satan. He did not confront him directly. Michael the archangel runs around behind Jesus and says, you get him. <laughs> Do you understand? Because if not, you're going to end up like the cats in this story. Okay, these, these guys, okay? So I'll just kind of <laughs> go back to the story. An evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Verse 16, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This is what's going to happen when you start playing games with the spiritual realm. We have victory in Jesus Christ. Our, our, we are certain, safe, and secure in Jesus Christ. But you start playing games and you're going to have problems. John, the apostle, writes about this in his first letter, 1 John in chapter 4. He writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. These guys said we cast him out in the name, in Jesus that Paul preaches, right? They can't even use the name of Jesus because they don't know him. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children. And you have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And these sons of Sceva did not know Jesus, and they were tangling in an area they had no business. And I'll say, casting out demons is an unusual miracle. But if you're going to go into that place, you want to be wearing the full armor of God. Anybody know what book of the Bible talks about the putting on the full armor of God? Which Ephesians, is that? That's what we're talking about. We're in Ephesus right now. You wonder where Paul gets the idea. You better suit up if you're going to battle. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, okay? And we need to be suited and ready for battle. And we put on Christ. And in Christ, we have victory. Outside of Christ, you're toast, okay? Verse 17, this became known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Yeah, that got the word out. It's funny. Here's Paul preaching in the school of Tyrannus for two years. Two years. <laughs> 
And you'd think the word is spreading. Well, it is. You, you'll, we'll see. The word is spreading. But when these knuckleheads come to town and try to copycat, try to fake it, and, and then all of a sudden everybody notices, whoa, that's something we shouldn't be playing with. It's not a joke. This is real stuff. It says, they became to know the Greeks, Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. The fear of the Lord. This is where we begin our walk with Christ, is fear, reverence, respect, awe, understanding who we are dealing with. We're dealing with the God who said, let there be light, and light was, who created the world in six days and everything that's in it, who spoke and the scars were cast into the heaven. We're dealing with Almighty God, and we need to understand what we're doing here. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, has it in a really nice nutshell. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is taking what you know and applying it properly. What would God say to do? That's wisdom. The fear of the Lord is where wisdom begins. And, Proverbs 9 continues, and the knowledge of the Holy One, that's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I know Him. How do I know Him? Because He's touched my soul. He lives in my heart. How do I know that Christ is alive? Because He lives in me. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now I get it. Now it makes sense. I'm seeing creation through the Creator's eyes. I'm seeing the world go according to the way that He said it would. He has told us the end from the beginning, so we shouldn't be surprised when we flip on the news or open up our phone and start scrolling and seeing all all this crazy stuff going on. That's exactly what He said it was going to happen. And when you start fearing God, recognizing He holds everything in His hands, and you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and the scales come off, you start knowing and understanding what's going in the, on in the world even better. And so, fear fall on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, right? Nothing like open the, opening up the door, opening up the window, and letting the sun, Jesus Christ, letting the sun shine in. That's the way that you're going to bring about change in people's lives. Verse 18, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds, believing and confessing, okay? (laughs) When you start seeing the dark side and you start seeing the fruit of darkness, when you start seeing the wages of sin, when you start seeing the path the way that leads to destruction, it's broad. Everybody's on it. Oh, everybody's doing it. But you realize I've been on that road and I know what happened to me. And I got off that road and I found the narrow way. When we start seeing that, you begin, it says, believed and came confessing and telling their deeds, right? Kind of like Simon the sorcerer. We read about him back in chapter 8, right? There's revival going on in Samaria, and Philip's down there, and Simon and the sorcerer, and John and Peter come out to check out everything, and this guy gets born again. He was, he was a charlatan. He was a quack. He was, he was a sorcerer, but he got born again, but then he heard about the Holy Spirit, and he goes, oh, how much will that cost? I want to buy the Holy Spirit, and Peter says, he rebukes him. You and your money perish, and he prays, oh, forgive me, you know, that I would be uh, made whole. I believe Simon the sorcerer got saved, but he had to have a come to Jesus moment where you realize you don't pay, you don't buy, you don't purchase the Holy Spirit. I grew up in a uh, home that was filled with all kinds of name it and claim it, grab it and blab it, positive mental imaging, uh, all the stuff, put it on your refrigerator and stare at it and make it come true and all this kind of stuff. And somehow that we can buy all of these things from the Lord by the way we behave or what we do. And you have to understand, you can't make God love you any more than He already loves you. 
2,000 years ago, before you were ever born, He died for you. He gave everything for you. And all this stuff just doesn't add up to anything. So many believe came confessing. You know, that confession, as we see this sorcery, we see this demons, we see these sons of Sceva and the exorcism and all these things, the confession... The confession is, is taking, make, bringing it out into the open. Like I said, let the sun shine in. And it's like light coming into a, a, a place and, and ex, exposing the darkness. Um, it's like a magician and his magic. His magic doesn't work. And nobody's impressed once the secret's out. When you know how a magician does his trick, can you be fooled anymore? And this is the thing, so many of us are fooling ourselves. The Bible says we're deceiving ourselves because we're holding our sins secret. We don't want to share our sins with the world. And you have to understand, this is how you get rid of it. It becomes impotent. There's no power. Sin has no power over you. When you confess it, let the sunlight in, let people know, and you're free. And many of you in the room can give a big amen because that's what we do. We confess our sins, and then Jesus is faithful and just to cleanse of, of our sins and forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. But as long as you're playing secret sin, it's got power over you. But these people, they figured it out. Now they're confessing and they're telling their deeds, and uh, this sin is all of a sudden no more power. Verse 19, also many of those who had practiced magic, okay, now you might think, anybody here in this room a magician? I'm in church. I'm not going to admit it if I was, right? No. But, you know, we've had uh, prestidigitators. We've had illusionists here in the church. They were Christian, and they would come, and they would do these amazing shows for us, but they would tell us the secret and see, show us how we can be so gullible. It looks so real until I tell you how I do it, and all of a sudden, you can't be fooled anymore. So that's their ministry, is to expose these secrets. But these people in Ephesus, many of them were practicing all of this magic or occult or sorcery or pharmakia, all these different types of things which were doorways to Satan and the demonic realm. And these are things that we do today, okay? Even with uh, substance abuse, right, whether it's drugs or alcohol or these kinds of things or too much caffeine or whatever, we're opening the door to something else controlling us. Remember, greater is he who is in you, Christian. You have Christ indwelling you. But if you open that door and start filling it up with all kinds of stuff, there's a parable Mark teaches in the Gospel of Mark about a man who cast out a demon, right? But he didn't sweep the house clean. He didn't finish the job. And it says seven more demons returned and lived in that house. You've got to open up the door, let the sunlight in. And that's what these people are doing. They recognize, I'm playing with this stuff on the internet. I'm playing with this stuff at the bar. I'm praying, playing with this stuff with my friends. I'm, I'm messing with these things that are powers, right? And, and you look at things like uh, tarot cards or Ouija boards or seances or astrology charts, as, yeah, astrology charts, all these kinds of things, they're doorways to the demonic. You should not open them up. You shouldn't play with them. So many believe, confessing, telling their sins, and all many of those who practice magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. It's estimated that's somewhere between one to five million dollars, depending on the size of the pieces of silver, right? How much they weighed. But that's a lot of money. This is a lot of value and assets and wealth that the people in Ephesus, all of a sudden, they're getting born again. And now what am I going to do with this junk, this, this false god, this doorway to the demonic? I don't want that in my house. I remember when I was born again. It's coming up on like 36 years ago or something. But I was that guy. I had those. I, I, I lived in the age of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I did my best to be a hero. But I came to the place where I recognized I was a zero, and I needed Jesus Christ. And as I would go through my house and I'd look around, I'm like, this stuff has to go. And, you know, whether it was the 
the paraphernalia or uh, <laughs> um, my secular music. I used to spend half of every paycheck on concert tickets and I'm dating myself, cassette tapes. <laughs> but I had hundreds, I had about 600 cassette tapes. I was just a music file, but most of it was trash, it was garbage. And when it was time for me, I'm like, you know, I can't be having that in my life. I need to detox. I need to get this stuff out of my life. I thought, I'll load it all up in boxes and I'll take it down to the thrift store. And then God spoke to me, goes, why would you give that poison to somebody else? And so all the paraphernalia, all the cassette tapes, they all went in the dumpster. It just needed to be trashed. It's not good to pass on to anybody else. So that's what's happening in Ephesus. I mean, it's bonfire time, millions and millions and millions of dollars of stuff, and everybody's coming to town and just burning it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This, if when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you step off the throne and you say, you run the show, take the wheel, Jesus, I don't want to drive anymore. There's some things in your life that got to go. I love what uh, Kelly Bolin always says. <laughs> the only thing that you have to change when you come to Jesus is everything. That's just one thing, just everything, right? It's just, it, you're going to have to get rid of all that. Well, that's what's happening, and it's, it's really cool. Uh, they counted up the volume. It totaled 50,000 pieces of silver, verse 20. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And if you're a student of the Scriptures and you're following along, this is the sixth progress report of what's going on as the church is growing and expanding, as Luke has laid this out. So you can kind of break up the book of Acts into all these different progress reports. And now we've just arrived to another milestone here at Ephesus on the second missionary journey that the Lord grew, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Okay. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who had ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. Now Luke doesn't mention why Paul was going back here in chapter 19, but we'll see it later in the book of Acts and in the epistles, and in fact, in Romans 15, 25 through 31, and 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4, we'll see that there is a famine going on in Jerusalem. And the Christians who are now persona non grata amongst the people of Israel, because they're not Jews, they've, they've, they've followed after this Jesus, now they're, they're part of the canceled culture. They can't get a job, they can't get work, it's famine, and they're pretty down and out. They need help. And word gets around to Paul, and he says, I know, we'll go to all these other Christians, all these other churches, and we'll take an offering, and we'll bring that offering back to Jerusalem to help them weather this famine, weather this storm. So that's what's going on. So he sends Timothy, we've already seen um, him join the party, and Erastus. And these guys are going to go on ahead through Achaia and Macedonia and touch base on all the churches who have been collecting for this good cause, okay? Um, and then he says he wants to go to Rome, okay? In Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 15, Paul will write, I wanted to come to see you earlier, and this is at this time. He doesn't make it yet, but he will after his third missionary journey. So this is Paul's plan in the Holy Spirit. James writes about, you say, this day I'm going to go this way, and that day I'm going to go there, and I'm going to make a profit in this town, I'm going to do business over there. And he says, that's foolish talk. You don't know what tomorrow brings. Your best bet is to do what you can with today, right? And just say, if the Lord wills, I'll go here or I'll go there. So often, as I'm talking about future plans, I'll say something like, if the Lord tarries, which is to say He doesn't return, because you know Jesus can come back any second, right? We are expecting the return of Jesus Christ to this planet like yesterday would have been good, Lord. W looking at the things that are going on in the world, but we do know time is short. We are in those days that the Bible speaks volumes about, the last days, the end times. And as we look at things that are going on in the world, uh, and we just see things that could not have ever happened 
in any other time in human history, even in the last 20 years. And I know I've been born again, like I said, 36 years, and I believe Jesus is going to come back any day. That's what the Bible teaches. In fact, all Peter and Paul and and John, they believed Jesus was coming back any day. God wants us to live in expectation. But as we read the prophecies of what the end time is going to look like, it looks a lot like the world today. America abandoning Israel, Israel standing alone against the world, all of the different uh, natural disasters that are, we just heard, was it, you were saying uh, 700 tornado reports in Oklahoma 600 have touched down so far this tornado season. It's off the charts. Is that a reason to run and hide, you know, and duck and cover? No, that's the reason to get on the rooftop and shout, Jesus is Lord. (laughs) Praise God. Everything the Bible said is too. Get on the bus. We're going home, okay? This is the time for us to get more and more vocal and more and more active and more and more hopeful and more and more joyful and more and more excited because we're going to heaven. I mean, that should rock your boat, right? So we see these things, but in this case, Paul says, I'm, I'm going go on to go on to Rome after, after we hook up in, in Jerusalem, verse 23. And about that time, so now we're getting to the end of his stay in Ephesus. We, we marked it out as somewhere around three years, give or take just a little bit. About that time, there arose a great commotion about, do you see that, the way? This is the third time we've heard that term used for the church, okay? A great commotion occurred about the church, if you want to say it that way, the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Dinah, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. Now remember, Ephesus is the center of Dinah worship. That's the Roman name for her, or Artemis. She was a a Greek goddess of the forest animals, the wild animals, and she was commingled with Ashtoreth, the um, Semitic goddess of fertility. The temple in Ephesus, you remember from our last study, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, 127 pillars, 60 feet tall, held up this wonderful thing, four times greater than the Parthenon, nothing quite like it in the world. People came from everywhere to see it and to worship this Dinah, who they believed was embodied in this meteor that fell to earth, and they had this meteorite enshrined in the temple. They would do all their pagan worship there. Well, this Demetrius... It says he's a silversmith. He made little trinkets. He made souvenirs. He made fetishes. People could wear around their neck or say, look, I got a copy of Diana. And people would come all over around the world to buy these, these souvenirs, right? And so he called together, verse 15, the workers of similar occupation and said, men, you know that we have our prosperity in this trade. Basically, that it's the God of mammon. It's the God of money, the God of wealth, the God of gaining possessions. And these men of the trade, they were either the ones that made it or sold it, right? And he says, you know, that's where our our livelihood comes from. Verse 26, moreover, you see in here that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying, they are not gods, which are made with hands. And that is true. Okay, Isaiah 44 is a wonderful passage on these false idols, right? They're made of wood, they're covered with metal, and with half the wood you burn a fire and you get warm and you cook your meal, and on the other half you bow down and you worship the stupid thing. You know, they don't have mouths they can speak, eyes they can see, ears that they can hear, they don't have any hands, they can't do a thing for you, these false idols. Well, that's true, It's, it's, it's Judaism, it's Christianity, it's the Word of God. We're to worship only one God. That's your first commandment. Thou shall have no other gods before me, right? There's only one God. Um, but these guys are going, you know, they, they're drawing people away. Uh, more of you see in here that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia. And so he's been teaching for two years. <laughs> Demons have jumped all the exorcists and all this, the words going around. This Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificent destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. And so we've got this, this 
picture growing here of this unrest, this, this pushback, this protest against Christianity. Verse 28, now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Dinah of the Ephesians, right? And so they've got this, this basically this protest, if you want to call it that. That's what we seem to hear it called on the news, rioting. Um, burning, pillaging, violence, raging. They like to say it's protesting. We see it in the news. Pliny, the elder, one of the Roman statesmen of the day, wrote to another official in Rome by the name of Trajan, describing how the people aren't going to the shrines anymore because of the Christian influence. They're upending our economy, okay? Pliny wanted to know what he should do, we should do about it. I like what Charles Spurgeon has to say about this, and listen for just a second, because it might bear uh, value to us in the day that we're living in. With all these false gods and idols and things that we're subject to being involved with, Charles Spurgeon would say, this is how we should endeavor to change society. I wish the gospel would affect the trade of London. That's where he was a preacher. I wish it might. There are some trades that need affecting. Uh, human trafficking, you know, some of the things in this world that really, they need to go away. Need to be cut a little shorter. And then look what Spurgeon has to say. Not by an act of parliament. Let acts of parliament leave us alone. We don't want the government telling us what to do. The government can just back off. But he does say, we can fight that battle alone. But it may come to an end by the spread of the gospel. I have no faith in any reformation that does not come through men's hearts being changed. And I, I, I told you, May 21st, get out and vote, pull the lever, be part of this society that God has blessed us with. You know, you hear people talk about, oh, we shouldn't get involved with uh, politics and keep the religion separate and all those kinds of things. Let me ask you a couple questions. Does God do accidents? Are you sure? Not one? None? Can't think of an accident God's ever done. Okay. Did God cause you to be born American or you live in America? Is that an accident? You live in the freest country in the world. You live in a place where we have an opportunity to go out and affect the world that we live in. Not just Idaho, not just America. We can affect the world we live in if we will participate. And that's not an accident. So when people come to me and say, are you promoting Christian nationalism? I'll say, you betcha. I'm promoting Christian parenting. I'm promoting Christian marriage. I'm promoting Christian work ethic. I'm promoting Christian nationalism. I think everything should be Christian. And I don't back down. And this is something that sometimes people get it all mixed up in their head. I think Spurgeon said it really good. The temple of Dinah, they were saying, was being despised. Her magnificent was being destroyed. And so Demetrius is kind of clever here. He hits them on two appeals. First is the appeal to financial self-interest. It's going to cost you in your pocketbook. Being a Christian might cost me. Hmm. It's going to cost you in your pocketbook. And then civic pride. Yeah, what about your race, your ethnicity, your position in life? You're going to have to lay down your life, lay down your pride, lay down your ego, lay down your bank account. It doesn't mean that God can't and won't bless you. I've been more blessed since I began walking with the Lord than I ever was when I was trying to claw and scratch and grab a pile for myself. It's, but it's going to have to come at that, that, that passage. And basically, then Demetrius is going to go use the argument, everybody's doing it. They're all worshiping Diana, except these people, these troublemakers. Um, 
And yet we're going to see in verse 17, I'm just going to give a, and then we're going to run through this story pretty quick. In verse 17, the city clerk is going to step up and say that Paul did not blaspheme the goddess of Dinah. All he did was preach Jesus Christ. And this is our weapon. This is how we fight this battle. This is how we war against the powers in this world today is we preach Jesus. We save souls. We disciple people into the way of life that leads to heaven. And if we will do that, we don't have to worry about how people are going to vote. They're all going to vote Jesus. They're all going to vote the Bible. If we would just get busy with our job, which is going out and spreading the good news. Amen? Okay, so let's finish up here. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, and Paul's traveling companions. So he picked up a couple people up in Macedonia, in Thessalonica, or Berea, or wherever he was, um, and he brought them along. And now they grab these guys. They're taking them hostage, right, in this big old protest. This theater is estimated to hold about 25,000 people. It said it filled the theater with people from Ephesus, and there's going to be this protest, this riot break out. So the whole city was filled with confusion. God is not the author of confusion. First Timothy uh, tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind, okay? One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we can see the fruit of it, is self-control. And the wrath of man will not bring about the righteousness of God, but these people have lost it, right? I don't have to go far if I just said, look at the news, look at the college campuses, look at the protests, and people that are so ignorant of the truth are out there just doing violence to America and want to destroy this good nation that God has given us. And I love it that I'm starting to see on the college campus students rising up pro-America and pushing back and shouting down, drowning out the cries of those who would destroy this wonderful country that we have. At any rate, they captured these guys, verse 30, and when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. They're going to tear you up. You know, that's not smart. Uh, verse 31, then some of the officials of Asia who were his friends, okay, these are Asiarchs, okay, leaders or rulers in Asia. And it says some of the officials, these, these rulers who were his friends, Paul had made friends in high places. He hung out with the governor, with the senators, with the rulers. And this is something we should do. In fact, we're blessed that in this church we have city councilwomen. We have police chiefs. We have people that are part of making our society good. And as more opportunity comes, whether it's from the Springs Calvary Chapel or churches in our area, when we hear of good Christian people rising up and they're on the ballot, we need to make sure they're the ones in charge so that we can be like Paul and say, we've got friends in the leaders when we need that, okay? So he has friends, uh, um, and uh, uh, verse 31, so some of the officials of Asia who are his friends sent him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Please, Paul, don't go in there. You know, it's like throwing meat to the sharks. It's not going to be good. Verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. <laughs> uh, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude and the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense of the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for two hours, Great is Dinah of the Ephesians! Great is Dinah of the Ephesians! Great is Dinah of the Ephesians! And they just descended into this free, free Palestine or whatever chance, and that's all they can do. That's as deep as they can get, and they get into this mantra, and they get into this uh, basically brainwashing themselves into this stupor, and they're just in a complete mob, a complete rage, okay? Whenever you see that, you can be sure it's not Jesus. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, 
What man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell down from Zeus? So the city clerk, this is like the mayor. He gets up and he quiets the crowd down and goes, you guys all know Ephesus is famous, the temple, the, the place of Diana. We all know that, right? You don't have to say this over and over again. We already get that, okay? So basically, he's appealing to them. He's appeasing them. He's trying to build a bridge. He's trying to get attention of this out of control mob, verse 36, therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly, okay? Just simmer down. Take a pill, chill, you know? <laughs> he says, uh, verse 37, for you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. They didn't do anything wrong because remember, it said a lot of were confused. They didn't even know why. Why are we here? What's this about? I don't know. Just say what they say. Okay, okay. Just brainless people, right? They didn't even know why they were there. Verse 38, therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry, make it, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar, there being no reason which may we give an account for this orderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. You guys need to chill it. You're going to bring the heat down on us. Rome would come in with the soldiers and take over, and it would be martial law. Your rioting like this is going to, you're going to lose your privileges. You guys need to get a, a brain back together again here. And so that's basically it. Today we see people, and they just get, it's funny how you can come to church and somebody wants to praise God. Somebody wants to raise their hands. Listen, if you want to raise your hands while we're worshiping, that's fine. I said this last time in the first part of the chapter. If you, if you want to, you know, sit down while we're worshiping, that's fine too. You don't have to stand up. You have liberty. You have freedom to worship. What we don't do is become a distraction to others who are also trying to worship God, okay? When you do that, you're no longer drawing or focusing your attention on Jesus. Maybe you are, but everybody else in the room is watching you. And you, you, don't, you didn't come here to be a distraction. I know you didn't. You came here to worship Jesus. We all came to worship Jesus. So we want to do things decently and in order. But I know a lot of us come from a religious background where it's rather restrained. We sit, we sing, first, first, second verse. See, which one is this one? Number three, and try to follow it. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about from the hymn books and all that kind of stuff. And then there's others who come from a very Pentecostal, very radical, very expressive thing. And yet, as one body, worshiping one Jesus, we're looking for that thing that draws us all to Jesus Christ. And so, that's what the city clerk is saying. Remember, he's a friend of Paul's, and, and he puts a lid on everything. I'm just going to read the first verse out of chapter 20. I'm done. Ralph, wherever you are, you should start doing your background music stuff, because we're going to close. <laughs> Verse 41, and when he said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Okay, they quashed the riot. Everything's calm. Verse 20, chapter 20, verse 1, after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. I just wanted to read that, okay? So he's been there for three years. Have you heard there's a Holy Spirit? We didn't even know. He lays hands on them. They're born again. The Spirit is manifest. It's active. There's teaching. There's preaching. There's church planting. There's miracles. There's unusual miracles. Wonderful things are happening. Fakes and charlatans are coming along, and they're trying to delude the people, dupe them, rip them off. But God is there, and they're shown to be quacks, fakes for what they are. And they all say, this is, we got to change. You know, we got rid of our old sins, and we confessed, and we got real with God. And the church grew, and things are going wonderful. But there was impact. It did affect the economy. It did affect the community. It did change society. And this is what Spurgeon is saying. I would pray that we could be people who through the gospel of Jesus Christ would change the world that we're in. If we will do that, because who else is going to do that job? There's politicians out there. They've got all kinds of things they say they're going to do. A lot of them, I, I like them. I'll vote for them. But who's going to preach the gospel if it's not me? 
if it's not you. You think somebody that's not in church this morning is going to do that? You think somebody that doesn't know Jesus is going to do that? That's on us. And so if we really want to be about changing this world, we should take every tool that God has given us. Paul used his Roman citizenship. Paul used the law. Paul used everything he could to promote the gospel. But at the end of the day, he used those things to promote the gospel, to make Jesus Christ famous. That's the business we need to be about. Amen? Amen. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this uh, wonderful picture of, of you in action, your Holy Spirit moving through Paul and the disciples in Ephesus. Lord, we pray that we would be that, that we would be alive with your Holy Spirit, that we would see miracles, normal miracles, which you do all the time, God, and unusual miracles, but not for the miracles. We want to see you. We want the world know that this is your house, that we worship you, that you live here, not only uh, amongst us, but in us. Help us to be that living water. Help us to be fountains, springs of living water pouring into our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.